With the failure of the show operation and the loss of half of Admiral Kurita's fleet, the original purpose and goal of the Special Attack Corps to make possible Kurita's breakthrough into Leyte Gulf by knocking out enemy flight decks was gone. Yet the Corps and its attack method continued. Its new objective was to cooperate with the army in the general destruction of enemy forces, now that the chance was passed for eliminating the enemy's first beachhead at Leyte. Accepting this situation, the High Command decided that the enemy forces on Leyte could be opposed effectively if the defending Japanese army divisions were provided with sufficient reinforcements. Accordingly, starting in November, Japanese air activities were directed toward the support of attempts to reinforce the Leyte garrison. Toward this end, Japanese planes concentrated their attacks on disrupting enemy transportation. At first, kamikaze efforts had been directed solely against aircraft carriers. It was now settled that enemy transports were also targets worthy of these attacks. So it was that naval planes were used in support of army efforts at reinforcement. However, the first air fleet, which had no more than 50 planes even before special attacks were started, soon exhausted its strength, as did also the second air fleet. Yet, despite the continuing dauntless attacks by kamikazes, enemy task forces still cruised in the waters east of the Philippines and supported the consolidation of Tacloban and the development of its air bases. It became obvious that a new enemy landing could be expected at any time. With the heavy attrition of land-based Japanese planes in late October and early November, it was evident that further reinforcements were necessary. Every effort was expended to send south from the homeland as many planes as possible in mid-November to supplement our land-based efforts in the Philippines. However, Vice Admiral Onishi, as Chief of Staff of the Combined Land-Based Air Force, had already been convinced that any defence based on conventional air attacks was hopeless. He made a hurried flight to Tokyo in early November to inform Imperial General Headquarters and Combined Fleet of the critical Philippines situation, and to demand 300 planes as reinforcements for the Special Attack Corps. With 300 planes, he believed that the enemy's anticipated move against Luzon could be met successfully. As a member of the Admiral's staff, I accompanied him on the trip to Japan. It saddened me to note at this time what a deep toll the daily strain of war had taken of him. His health was so poor, in fact, that on his return trip he had to be carried on board the Type 1 bomber, Betty on a cot. Convinced finally by the crucial war situation, as much as by Admiral Onishi's urging, Imperial headquarters concurred in his views, but nowhere were 300 planes available for the Philippines. Desperate efforts finally squeezed a meagre 150 planes from the training centres at Omura, Genzan, Tsukuba and Kono Ike. These planes were manned primarily by reserve ensigns, none of whom had more than 100 hours of flight training, plus a few student trainees and instructors. They were all incorporated into the 1st Air Fleet, organised as a new special attack corps, and transferred to Formosa for special training. Thus, when Admiral Onishi returned to the Philippines, I rode back with him only as far as Formosa, where it was my duty to arrange for the special training of the new pilots. In the organisation of the Combined Land-Based Air Force, the supervision of special kamikaze flight training had become one of my principal duties. By the time the first units arrived in Formosa, my instruction programme was ready to begin at Taichu and Tainan, the designated training bases. The indoctrination for the new Kamikaze Corps pilots lasted seven days. The first two days were spent exclusively in takeoff practice. This covered the time from the moment the order to sortie was given until the planes of a unit were airborne and assembled. During the next two days, lessons were devoted to formation flying, with a continuation of interest in takeoff practice. The last three days were given primarily to the study and practice of approaching and attacking the target. But here again, takeoff and formation practice were included. Had time permitted, this whole schedule would have been run through a second time. Two months of experience in kamikaze operations had shown that certain methods were more effective than others in achieving successful hits against the enemy. Special emphasis was placed on instruction, which pointed out all possible advantages to the pilots. Some of the more important points for consideration were as follows approaching the target. 
For such light and speedy planes as the Zero Fighter and the Suisse Carrier Bomber, two methods of approaching for a special attack were found most effective. The approach should be made either at extremely high or extremely low altitude. Although from the standpoint of navigational accuracy and range of visibility, a medium altitude was most suitable, this was ruled out by other considerations. A high altitude of 6,000 to 7,000 metres was the best for avoiding enemy fighter planes. Planes at that height are not easily visible from sea level, and although enemy radar could detect such an approach well in advance, it took time for enemy fighters to climb up within attack range. Also, the higher the altitude, the greater the difficulties of interception. Above 4,000 metres the air is rarefied, and pilots must use oxygen. At 7,000 metres a pilot's ability to fight is impaired, as vision and accuracy of judgment decrease. At this altitude any trouble with oxygen equipment may result in the pilot's blacking out and losing control of his plane. These factors made a high-altitude approach most desirable from the standpoint of evading enemy fighters. In an extremely low-altitude approach, our planes would fly close to the surface of the sea to prevent early detection by enemy radar. In late 1944, enemy radar was believed to have an effective range of about 100 miles at high altitude and less than 10 at medium or low altitude. Visual detection of our planes skimming low over the water was also difficult for the enemy's combat air patrol, so that the danger of their being intercepted was further reduced. Both these methods had been used to advantage in the Philippines during October and November. When several attack units were available, both high and low approach methods were used in conjunction with varying approach courses. When the enemy target was sighted, planes of all units would converge toward the point of attack for the final run-in. Angle of attack in a high-altitude approach, caution must be taken to ensure that the final dive angle is not too steep. In a long, steep dive, as the force of gravity increases, a plane is more difficult to pilot and may go out of control. It is essential, therefore, to make the dive as shallow as possible, taking careful note of wind direction and the movement of the target. A plane making a low-altitude approach must, on sighting the target, climb sharply to 400 or 500 metres before going into a steep dive on the target. This method requires skill on the pilot's part because the hit should be made down onto the deck of the target ship for greatest effectiveness. As an example, one day a flight of several Zero fighters took off from Cebu and flying low took a circuitous route through Surigao Strait toward Tacloban. They suddenly discovered an enemy cruiser near Dulag. One of the planes made an abrupt steep climb and an almost perpendicular plunge for a direct hit on the target's deck. The ship split in two and sank. Since this action was reported by a high-flying fighter plane, the ship attacked may have been a destroyer instead of a cruiser, but the prompt sinking proved the effectiveness of hitting the deck at a steep angle. Point of aim against carriers. The best point of aim is the central elevator or about one-third the length of the ship from the bow. Next best is either the fore or aft elevator, both being vulnerable locations, since the destruction of these sections destroys the operational effectiveness of the ship. Against other types of ships, the base of the bridge, where the ship's nerve centre is located, is the most desirable target. A direct hit there is almost certain to render the ship inoperational. Against destroyers, other small warships and transports, a hit any place between the bridge and the centre of the ship is usually fatal. Small warships and transports, having no deck protection, are extremely vulnerable to aerial attack. A single kamikaze plane could sink such vessels with a direct hit, target selection. Had there been no shortage of planes, it would have been desirable to send four kamikazes against a large carrier, two to strike the central elevator, and one each the fore and aft elevators. In theory, two or three attackers were considered ideal against an escort carrier. In practice, however, there were too many enemy carriers, and we had too few planes available to set any such standard. Accordingly, in the hope of a telling direct hit, a single plane was usually sent against each carrier. Emphasis was also placed on the importance of the type of target to be selected. When targets were plentiful, it was especially important that efforts be concentrated on the most valuable ones. For example, on the 30th of October, a kamikaze unit left Cebu at 1.30pm 
to attack an enemy task force at a point distant 40 miles, bearing 150 degrees from Suluan Island. At 2.30 p.m., these planes discovered three American carriers and a battleship south-southeast of Suluan Island. Of the first group of three attacking planes, two scored direct hits on a large carrier, and one hit a medium-sized carrier. After observing these hits, the second group of three kamikazes plunged in. One of them hit the big carrier again, and the others hit a small carrier and the battleship. The big and medium carriers stopped dead in the water, gushing huge clouds of smoke, while the small carrier and the battleship were heavily damaged. This was a fine example of appropriate target selection. Every effort was made in training to achieve this kind of judgment and ability. Takeoff in carrying out special attacks, it is very important that a pilot board his plane, take off, get into formation, and move toward the target with all possible speed. A properly camouflaged plane parked away from the airstrip is seldom damaged by enemy plane attacks, but once the camouflage is withdrawn and the plane is moved to take off position, it is in clear view and as vulnerable as a sitting duck on a pond. Even after a kamikaze plane has gained the air, it is still very vulnerable to attack because its 250 kilogram bomb load prohibits radical offensive or evasive tactics. Consequently, special attack pilots were given intensive takeoff training to develop speed and agility so that they could avoid interception at the critical start of their sortie. The morale of kamikaze pilots was so high that they sometimes sorted even if the plane's engines were not functioning properly. Foolhardiness in this regard often resulted in failure to carry out the mission, or even forced landings and damage to the plane. To forestall such mischance, it was strongly impressed on the pilots that they must check and promptly report any malfunction of their aircraft. In a heavily loaded takeoff, it is important to keep the nose of the plane from rising too soon, to manipulate the controls slowly, and to hold an altitude of 50 metres until good flying speed is achieved. Pilots were also cautioned to concentrate all their energies and attention on getting off the ground and not to be distracted by their comrades at the time of takeoff. A final important element at the beginning of a mission is the matter of joining and keeping formation with a minimum of time and effort. To attain formation without circling, planes should be airborne at 100 metre intervals after the leader and then gradually close ranks. It was repeatedly stressed that individual planes should keep formation no matter what weather was encountered. Navigation, navigational training is of utmost importance if a pilot is to locate assigned destinations. Accordingly, kamikaze trainees were firmly impressed with the need for checking reference points, holding to course, and keeping track of time and distance flown in search of the enemy. But so hastily were the units of the Special Attack Corps thrown together that much basic training had to be taken for granted. In mid-November, for example, an enemy task force was reported to the east of Laman Bay and three kamikaze planes were dispatched to attack it. The following day, the number two plane returned to base. The pilot reported that they had arrived at the location given only to find bad weather and no enemy task force. While searching the area, the planes became separated. When this particular pilot lost his mates and was still unable to find the enemy, he flew westward in search of Luzon Island and his base. He finally sighted land and put down in the first open space he saw. It was a Chaig, nearly 150 miles north of Manila. The next day he flew southward, following the canyons, until he reached an airbase and landed at Clark Field. In checking this unbelievable tale, it was found that the pilot had no map or chart and no timepiece, other than the rumblings of his empty stomach. Without a leader, he was practically flying blind, and this was not an isolated case. It was constantly urged that every pilot should have, in addition to an air chart, an outline map of the Philippines drawn by himself, so that he would be familiar with the general area. In the urgency and anxiety of the period, such basic precautions as this were relegated to a mere hope that each pilot would take it upon himself to exercise essential care and caution. The error of such wishful thinking should have been learned and remembered from the Battle of Midway. Bomb safety release. Escorting planes would sometimes report direct kamikaze hits, but no explosion on the enemy ship. This was a result of the pilot's failure to release the bomb safety before making his final plunge. 
Such cases were most regrettable because they meant the loss to us of an irreplaceable pilot and plane, with only negligible damage to the enemy. The individual reasons for such improvidence, thoughts of God's status, concern at self-immolation, fatigue, excessive excitement, or emotionalism, we shall never know. It is likely that the pilot's very concentration on scoring a telling hit made him forget that one vital step toward his goal. The first kamikaze pilots were instructed to release the bomb safety as soon as they were clear of land and flying over the sea. But then, if they were unable to find a target, the bomb would have to be jettisoned before they could make a safe landing back at the base. To correct this wastefulness, pilots were ordered to release the bomb safety only upon sighting the enemy. Still, some pilots would forget. This practice of pulling the release upon sighting the enemy was maintained, however, and provision was made that the leader of the fighter escorts would fly close to the special attackers on nearing the target and check to see that the safety had been released in each plane. Frequently, he would have to signal a reminder to a forgetful pilot. Such was the substance of instructions given to kamikaze trainees in Formosa, in the new course that I set up. The students took to their lessons with great enthusiasm. There was no actual practice given in low-altitude approaches, because the steep climb and sudden dive involved were too dangerous. But there was practice in 45 to 55 degree angle dives, using the airfield command post as a target. The pilots would come diving in at such a rate that we felt sure they would crash. It was frightening to see how close they would come, so great was their zeal in learning. Despite the short period of their indoctrination, the training was effective, and many of these Formosa-trained pilots achieved brilliant results. There is seldom a morale problem with frontline troops who are in daily contact with the enemy. Men who have faced the chilling whine of air attack, the bomb blasts, the booming of heavy bombardments, or a machine gun's staccato, men who have seen companions become the dead and dying victims of war, such men can readily develop the desire and maintain the will to fight and risk death. But to develop, let alone maintain, the same spirit in rear area troops is a difficult task. It was no problem to find the spirit required for kamikaze operations among the pilots in the Philippines, who had suffered relentless enemy attacks and had seen the futility of conventional bombing efforts against the enemy. But after the failure of the show operation, New pilots as well as planes were needed in the battle theatre if special attacks were to continue. The greatest problem for everyone concerned was how to instil the required aggressiveness and morale for special attacks into men fresh from flight training in the homeland. Imperial headquarters ordered the organisation of the new special attack corps with great misgiving. Its personnel were inexperienced and its equipment was in poor condition. Of the first 150 homeland planes assigned, not more than half were actually expected to reach the Philippines. Even with skilled pilots and good equipment, in other ferrying flights from Japan, an average of only 70% arrived in the Philippines. On one occasion, for example, 15 fighters were promised to reinforce the Philippines sector. Their arrival was looked for daily, but no word came even of their departure from the homeland. Finally, it was reported that they had taken off from Kanoya, but only 12 planes. The next information was that they were delayed in leaving Oroku in Okinawa. Ten were eventually able to continue from there. On the next hop, one was forced to land at Miyako-jima and another at Ishigaki-jima, so eight reached Formosa. Though there was nothing difficult about the last leg crossing Bashi Channel to Luzon, only five of the eight made it to Manila and landed at Nichols Field. Of these, one broke his landing gear and another damaged his tailwheel. Thus, three planes actually arrived in flyable condition. Tragic indeed. In the light of such experience, what could be hoped for from untrained kamikaze newcomers, various delays were expected in obtaining the new volunteers and making necessary preparations for their transfer. The first group of 150 planes, from Genzan in Korea and from Tsukuba and Kono Ike in Japan, came in short hops by way of Omura, Kanoya and Oroku. To the surprise of all, they arrived in Formosa within seven days after being ordered. Even more surprising, of the 150 that set out, 140 planes and 148 airmen actually reached Tainan for training. 
Only ten planes were damaged in getting to Formosa, and only two pilots dropped out because of illness. The eight extra men had squeezed in with friends, determined to come along even though no substitute planes were then available for them. Training of the new kamikaze candidates was completed as rapidly as possible, and each unit was rushed to the Philippines just as soon as it had finished its instruction. By early December, the enemy had begun heavy bombardments of our ground positions on Ormok Bay, on the western side of Leyte Island, and followed these shortly by landings along the bay. The focal point of our attacks was thereupon shifted from Leyte Gulf to the vicinity of Ormok and the Komote Sea. Despite all our efforts, however, we were unable to repel these enemy landings. And on the 14th of December, the Americans pushed northward through the Mindanao Sea and landed on Mindoro Island, evidently in preparation for an assault on Luzon itself. By that time, my intensive training program was almost completed. I found, however, that while I had 28 pilots, there were only 13 Zero fighters left. I gathered the pilots together and said, since there are just 13 planes available, only that many of you will go. We will send for the rest of you when circumstances permit. This raised a great problem. The pilots who were scheduled to remain behind searched through all the hangars and revetments and in the far corners of the field. They begged mechanics to put the best parts of condemned planes together into something that would fly. Many of these remnants had been sitting around for a long time. The mechanics caught the pilots' mood and went feverishly to work, urged and inspired by the eager young men. By departure time, twelve additional planes had been thrown together, bringing the total to twenty-five. The three extra pilots figured that they could ride along in the radio equipment spaces of three planes and begged to be taken to the Philippines. But the clear light of day showed that the twelve jury-rigged planes would never pass a test flight, and despite the willingness of every pilot to risk flying these mended crates, only the thirteen scheduled planes took off. That these fledgling pilots managed to deliver more planes than could have been expected of more experienced men gave assurance of the high morale of the kamikaze recruits and showed how keenly they felt their responsibility. Such spirit would seek to make possible the impossible, with my duties on Formosa completed. Now that the last planes were going south, I flew to the Philippines with the group of thirteen zeros and landed at Clark Field on the evening of the 23rd of December. There I found that 1st Air Fleet headquarters had already been moved out of Manila and was located on a small hill near Bamban Air Base, at the northernmost end of Clark Field. The reason for moving from Manila was that the enemy already was pushing beyond Mindoro. Enemy traffic through Surigao Strait was endless and undisturbed, except for our conventional aerial attacks against warships and shipping, which were repeated almost nightly. These were largely ineffectual against the vast might of the enemy, but kamikaze planes were not substituted because they were being saved for the decisive battle which appeared inevitable and imminent at Luzon Island. With conservation of aerial suicide forces in mind, the Japanese strategy was to move the greater part of its land forces to the north, around Baguio, leaving a few army and navy troops to defend Manila to the death. The northward movement had already begun, Agreements were drawn up between the Naval Air Force and Army units at Clark Field for defence preparations. In negotiations with the Army, Rear Admiral Ushi Sugimoto, of the 26th Air Flotilla, and Captain Toshihiko Odawara, Chief of Staff of the 1st Air Fleet, represented the Navy. The latter was a famous aviation expert, a writer, and a man of high character and ability. It illustrates the extent to which the situation on Luzon had deteriorated that these two naval air authorities had to attend to matters pertaining to land warfare. The site chosen for the defence of Clark Field was a mountain three kilometres to the west of Bambun. Positions were to be constructed in depth, starting at an elevation of about 300 metres. Admiral Onishi left the direction of all air operations to Admiral Fukudome and devoted his own energies to preparing land defences. Travelling the hazardous mountain paths, he made several trips to give personal attention and detailed orders concerning the building of the defence works. He appeared to have made up his mind to fight to the last at this place, where so many young men, using the tactics he had sponsored, had flown off never to return. At Bamban on New Year's Day 1945, 
Everyone assembled in an open space near the air raid shelters. Standing in ranks, we bowed in the direction of the homeland and prayed reverently for the health of the emperor. Our traditional broth with rice cakes was served to celebrate the arrival of the new year. This was really a treat, considering our sparse food rations, which had been stretched by a monotonous diet of watery potato soup. That evening a festive air pervaded the operations room, where boiled sweet potatoes and yokan sweet bean jelly from the homeland were being served as refreshments. The yokan had been passed around, and there was just one portion remaining when a message was brought in from the radio room. Admiral Onishi stopped the young messenger as he was about to leave and gave him the remaining bit of jelly. When Misaka, the code chief, was making his nightly inspection shortly afterward, he noticed a hum of excitement in the radio room. On closer look, he found all ten of the young radiomen jabbering gaily as they witnessed the cutting of a small portion of sweet bean jelly into ten equal bits, one for each of them. These young men had arrived in the last ship to reach the Philippines. They worked, half-naked, for long hours each day in the radio room, which was located in a hot, unventilated air raid shelter. They were undernourished and so thin that their ribs stood out like a skeleton's. When Misaka told of their delight with the small gift of Yokan, our hearts went out to these boys. Facing hunger and hardship, they stood stoically by the radio equipment at all hours of the day and night. When later it came time to retreat, they marched deep into the mountains with all their heavy gear and kept on working without complaint. They were, in their own way, the equal of the men who met death by plunging into enemy warships. That New Year's celebration was the last festive occasion we were destined to know at Bamban or anywhere else in the Philippines. Exactly a week later, the full force of the United States Navy descended on Lingayan Gulf, 100 miles to the north of Manila. For two days the guns of the most powerful navy in the world hammered the western shore of Luzon, and the planes of the innumerable U.S. carriers swept the skies overhead. On the 9th of January, the enemy began landing operations from a force of more than 1,000 ships. Throughout these enemy advances, from Leyte on, the planes of our special attack force continued to operate whenever possible. By the time of the Lingayan landings, however, the total Japanese air strength in the Philippines was reduced to fewer than 100 planes, a force utterly inadequate to check the progress of the enemy. Well before the Lingayan landings, however, the ultimate outcome was plain to the Japanese high command. Decision had already been made to establish the main defence in the mountains to the north of Manila. The bulk of the troops were being moved northward, leaving only a last-ditch detail of picked men to fight to the death from street to street and house to house. Now, with our air force almost bereft of planes, decision had to be made as to the disposition of our remaining air force officers and men. Shortly after noon on the 4th of January, Admiral Onishi summoned me to his office. Also present was Rear Admiral Tomozo Kikuchi, Chief of Staff of the 2nd Air Fleet. Admiral Onishi came immediately to the point. Now that there are no planes left, I am of the opinion that personnel of the 2nd Air Fleet should withdraw to the north and leave us of the 1st Air Fleet here to fight on to the last. How do you feel about that, Inaguchi? I considered the question with full realisation of the Admiral's responsibilities and replied, This area is under First Air Fleet jurisdiction, and since we are no longer capable of conducting air operations here, I believe that the Second Air Fleet too should move to the north while there is still a chance. Admiral Kikuchi had also been giving the matter deep thought. After a little hesitation he spoke up, I would not like to think of leaving the First Air Fleet behind. After all, our organisation is still intact. Admiral Onishi looked from one to the other of us. Thank you, gentlemen. I will pass this on to Admiral Fukudomi. It was two days later before we learned the result of that interview. In the meantime, the first air fleet was making rapid progress taking up its mountain positions for the final battles on land. The pilots, who now had little else to do, were the first to move. They marched to the mountains carrying what they could of weapons, food and camping equipment. On the 6th of January, Admiral Onishi summoned us back to headquarters. Present this time also was First Air Fleet Chief of Staff Odawara. Admiral Onishi began by handing us a combined fleet order, which had come in by way of the Southwest Area Fleet Headquarters at Baguio. 
The substance of this order was as follows. Second Air Fleet will be disbanded and its air units placed under command of First Air Fleet. First Air Fleet jurisdiction will be extended to include Formosa. First Air Fleet headquarters will withdraw to Formosa. Pilots and superior radio technicians will be withdrawn to Formosa. This order is effective from the 8th of January 1945. Admiral Onishi explained that succeeding messages had already advanced the effective date, so that the order now stood for immediate execution, and he asked for our comments. When Captain Odawara seemed reluctant to speak, I said, Admiral Onishi, please take your adjutant and leave at once. Captain Odawara and I can take care of things here and assist the commander of the 26th Air Flotilla. I firmly believed that Admiral Onishi was the only man capable of leading the way out of the miserable situation that confronted us. When I had accompanied him to Tokyo in late November, I had recommended to friends of mine in the Personnel Bureau and the Naval General Staff that he be called to Japan at once to direct the war effort. Aerial aspects of the war were becoming increasingly dominant, and he was an air admiral to the Corps. At this critical juncture of the struggle, he was the very man to take charge. I had said this in Tokyo, and felt it even more strongly at this time. That is why I now urged him to return to the homeland and direct operations from Tokyo, where his ability could have full opportunity to be most effective. He responded brusquely, You know full well that I cannot act as headquarters by myself. Of course I agreed, but your staff will follow at first opportunity. Please go while you can. The fact that the execution date of this order has been steadily advanced makes it obvious that they are trying to keep you alive for further tasks. Victory is now impossible, even if I did return to the homeland. You may not win, I argued, but you can still fight. Our forces are sadly weakened on the sea and in the air, but our submarines are still powerful. People would say that Onishi had made a hasty decision, he murmured. Furthermore, I am not too hopeful about our preparations for land fighting and I cannot leave someone else responsible for matters just because I do not feel confident about them. And how long will it take for you to get things in shape so that you will feel confident about them? I begged. I need at least ten days more, he said. In ten days it will be impossible to get out, I protested. And if you tried to leave ten days hence, the attempt would probably end in disgrace. You must make your decision to leave now. I cannot make any decision until I have talked to Rear Admiral Sugimoto and Vice Admiral Kondo. They would be responsible for this area if I leave, so it is only fair to ask their opinion. These talks were arranged, and at their conclusion, the various units were immediately notified that all airmen who had evacuated to the mountains were to be mustered again. The order was a difficult one to carry out. These flyers without wings had already dispersed and were scattered throughout the forest tangle over wide areas of the mountains. It amounted practically to going into the far reaches of the mountains to summon each man individually. In addition, a serious problem of morale was involved. The number of flyers to be evacuated to Formosa was limited strictly by the number of transports available for this withdrawal effort. Accordingly, the number of flyers notified had to be kept within this limit, since it was feared that general rumour of the withdrawal might cause the high spirit of the troops to break. Despite the difficulties involved, however, the designated men were assembled at headquarters by the afternoon of the following day. I had made all arrangements for their departure to the north that evening, the 7th of January. As a further result of Admiral Onishi's conference with Sugimoto and Kondo, it was decided at the request of these commanders that Ohonishi and his staff would wait three days before their departure, leaving then only if the enemy had not invaded Luzon itself. Admiral Onishi had also agreed to leave behind two of his staff officers, Commander Miyamoto, in charge of land fighting, and Commander Yaguchi of Ordnance. When the Admiral informed me of this and ordered the necessary arrangements, I objected, saying... If we are going to leave behind two members of your staff, let us all remain. If the staff is going to leave, let us all go. Admiral Onishi conferred again with Admiral Sugimoto on this last point, and they reached an understanding that no members of the first air fleet staff would be left behind. Rear Admiral Ushi Sugimoto was commander of the 26th Air Flotilla, and Vice Admiral Kazuma Kondo was chief of the air arsenal. 
During the following three days, half of the pilots and staff officers started overland toward Tuguegarao, where they were to in-plane for Formosa. This group, which had to fight it out with Filipino guerrilla forces on several occasions along the way, suffered great privation and hardship before reaching its destination. It was midnight on the 9th of January when the rest of us bade farewell to Admiral Sugimoto on the hill at Bamban and proceeded to Clark Field, where our plane for Formosa was waiting. We did not take off from Clark Field, however, until 3.45am the next morning. Our departure was delayed for more than an hour because Admiral Onishi got involved in a discussion with the commander of an air group remaining at the base and was unwilling to leave until he had won his argument. The sun was, therefore, bright in the sky by the time we reached Formosa. This was a matter of great concern, because the enemy now had complete daytime control of the air, even over Formosa, and we feared a fighter attack. To make matters worse, the island was blanketed with low-hanging clouds which made it impossible to land. While flying back and forth in search of a break in the cloud layer, we were suddenly greeted by bursts of anti-aircraft fire from the outskirts of Takao. To stay clear of this, we circled wide toward the sea and tried another approach, this time very low. We were lucky to find a clearing in the clouds over Tainan and made a safe landing at Takao Airfield. As we were rolling to a stop, an air raid alert was sounded, and within five minutes after we drove away, enemy carrier planes made a heavy attack on the airfield. We had had a narrow escape. Admiral Onishi later recalled this incident and remarked, if we had been shot down at that time, we would have avoided many later difficulties. He also thought many times of the men left behind in the Philippines, and while we were still in Formosa, I once heard him say, Some day I must parachute into the mountains around Clark Field and pay a visit to Sugimoto and his men. What was happening at headquarters was not always immediately known to the operating forces, but throughout November and December we at Mabalakat knew that the situation in the Philippines was rapidly deteriorating. On the 23rd of December, when my friend Inoguchi finally flew in with a group of 13 zeros, we knew by his presence that there would be no more reinforcements coming from Formosa. Reinforcements to Mabalakat were always routed in just before dark, to minimise the chance of their running afoul of the enemy. Commander Tamai and I would usually be at the field to greet the new arrivals, and also to observe their landing with a critical eye. We watched the landings of a new group from Formosa one evening, and Tamai nodded approvingly. Such smooth landings, Nakajima. It is amazing considering their youth and inexperience. The ground crews were ready and waiting. They took charge just as soon as each plane stopped rolling and stowed them in safe hiding places. The pilots themselves were brought to the command post by automobile. The leader lined his men up in front of Commander Tamai and spoke in a loud voice, full of self-assurance. Lieutenant Kanaya of the 201st Air Group, reporting in with 12 men, then, indicating one pilot who stood slightly apart, he concluded haughtily, This man is not a member of my group. Kanaya's words and tone showed that he considered this man an interloper. I had to smile, for the man he mentioned was a veteran pilot of the 201st Air Group who had just completed a special mission of bringing a plane back to the Philippines from Formosa. I could not help thinking how wrong Kanaya was with all his assertiveness, but at the same time I thought that this new lieutenant of kamikazes was a young man of promise. Heeding our advice about the importance of speedy takeoffs, Kanaya spent most of each day in practice. He would lead his men on the run from the command post to the planes, and through all the preparations for takeoff, in an effort to minimise their time in this routine. Despite the warm weather, these exercises were conducted in full flight gear. One day I was watching Kanaya's men at their drill, when the air raid warning suddenly sounded, and I saw a large formation of enemy B-24 aircraft approaching from the east. It was too late to reach air raid shelters, so I ordered everyone to cover. There were no foxholes or ditches, and the bamboo groves where our planes were hidden seemed the best place for safety. For myself, I found a small depression about five inches deep and lay there on my back watching the huge bombers come over. They approached in line with our position, flying at about 3,000 metres. I thought how terrible it would be if they made an accurate run on our location. Then, as all the enemy planes released their bombs simultaneously, 
I realized happily that the fall would be over. The veritable cloud of bombs whistling earthward sounded like an approaching typhoon, for they were not very far off target. There were moments of uncanny silence until thunderous explosions from the direction of Clark Field verified that we were safe. The enemy planes were gone, we crawled out of our various niches and were able to laugh now that the tension was released. Without saying it, each pilot seemed to be thinking, we are lucky, until we hit the enemy, our lives are very dear, we can't afford to squander them by getting killed carelessly. Kanaya's men continued to practice, and their timing improved. But mere improvement did not satisfy their leader, and each day the rehearsals went on. In organising a special attack, I would ask the leader of each group to present an availability and preparedness list. From these I would make out an organisation schedule for the commander. Every list submitted by Lieutenant Kanaya had his own name in top position. I explained, after making up the first list without choosing him, that if he went there would be no one to take care of the others in his group. Nevertheless, the very next time there was a call for candidates from his unit, Kanaya's name again headed the list. His every act demonstrated the true spirit of a special attacker. He was a model member of the Corps. Having consolidated his grip on Leyte and pushed a spearhead to Mindoro, the enemy moved in for the final landing assault on Luzon in early January 1945. This action called for the employment of our entire air strength, including the carefully husbanded special attack forces. But the might of the enemy was staggering, a reconnaissance plane reported, group of 300 enemy vessels west of Mindoro Island, course north, speed 14 knots. And this was followed by a second group of 700 enemy vessels, sighted to the south of first group, course north, speed 12 knots. At these reports we were amazed, shocked, never before had we encountered such a concentration of strength. What we did not know was that yet another group of three or four hundred enemy vessels followed after the second group that had been reported. The waters from Mindoro to Leyte were swarming with enemy ships, and these included many heavily armed warships which bristled with anti-aircraft guns to cope with our special attacks. The alerts and advance warnings from our reconnaissance planes were valuable, of course, but they gave no indication of the enemy's actual destination. Was he planning to land at Manila or in Lingayan Gulf? Perhaps it was a pari in northern Luzon, whence he might hope to cut off our withdrawal from the Philippines. With all these imponderables, there was one unfortunate thing of which we were sure. Our 201st Air Group had available only 40 operational planes to counter the operations of the overwhelming enemy. Headquarters ordered all available planes to make an attack, stating further that any planes not operational at this time should be destroyed by fire. Thereafter, the personnel of all forces were to be considered as ground-fighting troops. In compliance with this order, our 40 planes were mustered for one final attack against the enormously superior enemy. At 3.57pm on 5 January 1945, Kanaya led two escort planes and 15 bomb-laden kamikazes from Mabalakat in suicide attacks on northbound enemy ships to the west of Lubang Island. We now know that these ships were headed for Lingayan Gulf. It was reported that Kanaya's plane made a direct hit on one of them. That was the last day of planned operations by the first air fleet in the Philippines. Kanaya had looked after his men well and carried out his duties to the end. His mission in life was accomplished, so it was that the 5th of January came and passed. All operational planes had been launched, all unnecessary and unusable gear had been ordered burned. Combat infantry shoes were issued to all flight personnel. The time had arrived for us to become ground troops. It is impossible to determine which ship Kanaya hit, but seven US naval vessels were damaged by suicide attacks on the 5th of January 1945, in the Luzon area between Lubang Island and Lingayan Gulf. None of these, however, was sunk. On the morning of the 6th, however, I awoke to a most surprising situation. There were five Zero planes on the field, ready and in flying condition. In the long months of their association, the Zero had become a part of the lives of the maintenance men, and to them the order to burn these inoperable planes had been unthinkable. They had worked the whole night through, scavenging bits and parts from the various damaged hulks around the field. By dint of these arduous efforts, 
Five miraculously rejuvenated planes now stood ready to take off. Commander Tamai reported this development to headquarters and obtained permission to send these planes on a mission. This, in fact, proved to be the last attack by the naval air arm in the Philippines. When these five planes departed, the difference between pilots and mechanics would cease to exist, as all became land-fighting troops ordered to carry on the battle in the mountains. Such was the miserable strait to which our once victorious air fleets had been brought. Here on the field at Mabalakat, though, there was still the problem of choosing pilots for the five salvaged planes. Of the thirty-odd flyers available, only five could still be special attackers. Those not chosen were doomed to miss the kamikaze opportunity for which they had volunteered. Five planes would amount to little against the countless strength of the enemy. But these men had all earnestly sought their destinies as special attackers, and it was only fair to provide this opportunity for fulfilment. Yet because of the present alternative of land fighting in the mountains, assuring at least a slight prolongation of life, some of the men might wish to change their minds. I was often asked by visitors to the base if it was not difficult to order the sortie of special attack pilots. Such a question was as hard to answer as the subject was hard to explain. There were many ramifications. The order to sortie for kamikazes was tantamount to saying, go out and die in battle. If the order had been contrary to the will of the pilots, it would have been cruel, beyond description, and I could no more have given it than I could have expected the men to carry it out. In the course of the kamikaze effort there were dozens, scores indeed hundreds of special attack sorties launched upon my order. Neither my conscience nor the souls of those pilots could rest easy if their deed had been the product merely of command decision. In these crucial moments of the Empire, however, dire circumstances called for extreme measures, and the young pilots rose to the situation. My ordering the sorties was but a function within the system and my presence in the system was almost as defiant of rationality as the system itself. In view of the special circumstances, now that the 201st Air Group was practically disbanding, however, instead of simply designating the day's flyers, this one time I decided to call for volunteers. I ordered all of the pilots to assemble in front of the shelter. When they had gathered, I addressed the group, reviewing our situation and explaining how the splendid work of the maintenance men had provided an additional five planes. These are not in first-class condition, I pointed out. In fact, two of them cannot carry a 250-kilogram bomb, so they have each been loaded with two 30-kilogram bombs. When these planes have been dispatched, our air battle will have ended and the rest of us will join in the fight as land troops. In making plans for this last special attack, I want to know your wishes. With this I paused to give them a chance for reflection. When it was clear that they had understood my message, I continued, Anyone who wishes to volunteer for today's sortie will raise his hand. The words were scarcely uttered before every man had raised his arm high in the air and shouted here, as they edged forward with great eagerness. I was startled, almost overwhelmed by this demonstration. My heart beat faster, and my chest swelled with pride at the dedicated spirit of these young men. I breathed deeply and tensed my facial muscles into a scowl to keep from betraying the emotion that flooded over me. Since you all want so much to go, we will follow the usual procedure of selection. You are dismissed. As I turned to enter the shelter, several of the pilots reached out to grab at my arms and sleeves, saying, Send me. Please send me, send me. I wheeled about and shouted, Everyone wants to go. Don't be so selfish that silenced them and I entered the shelter to confer with the air group commander about the composition of the final list. We were in complete agreement as to who should lead this unit. Lieutenant Nakano had recently been hospitalised with tuberculosis in Manila. Upon his release, he had said to me, I am now recovered, but there is no telling when I may have a relapse. If this recovery were complete, I could wait my turn for duty at the regular time. But if the illness returns, there would be no chance for me to serve. Therefore, please send me on a mission at the earliest opportunity. Remembering his plea, I had kept him in mind for some short-range mission that would not tax his strength. This flight would not be long, and this was the last chance considering all the factors. Nakano was the ideal man for leading the mission. The four other pilots were selected purely on a basis of ability. 
They were Warrant Officers Goto and Taniuchi for the first unit, and Lieutenant Nakao and Warrant Officer Chihara for the second. Enemy air raids continued all this while, so that we hardly dared risk showing our heads. Enemy ships were swarming at Lingayan Gulf, and a landing there was imminent. In preparation for a 4.45 p.m. takeoff, the five planes, hidden at various points around the Mabalakat airfield, had their camouflage removed and engines warmed up. Now the training which had been practised so enthusiastically proved valuable. The pilots moved swiftly, as the first plane started to roll, the others followed in close order. The field was pockmarked with bomb holes, but following my hand signals, the planes were skilfully taxied to their starting places without mishap. As I waved my right hand in the signal for taking off, Lieutenant Nakano raised himself in the cockpit and shouted, Commander Nakajima! Commander Nakajima! Fearing that something had gone wrong, I ran to the side of his plane to learn what troubled him. His face was wreathed in smiles as he called, Thank you, Commander. Thank you very much. The simplicity of the words, the spirit of supreme dedication, robbed me of speech. I wished that I could find words appropriate to the exaltation of the moment, but no words would come. So, realising that enemy raiders might appear at any moment, and there was not an instant to lose, I wordlessly gave the signal for taking off. Nakano's plane started forward with a roar. As the second plane passed in front of me, the engine was revved down momentarily as the pilot screamed, Commander! Commander! I flagged him on with a vigorous wave of my arm, but through the din came back his shrieked farewell, Thank you for choosing me. I pretended not to hear these messages, but they tore at my heart. The scene repeated itself as each smiling pilot passed my position, and I waved on the next, number three, number four, number five. Each did the same as he flew off to his destiny, leaving me behind in a cloud of earthly dust. Assembling in formation, the five circled the field and then flew to the north with the evening sun of the Philippines glistening brightly on their wings. They must have felt the fervent blessings of their earthbound comrades, who stood and watched as they disappeared into the afternoon sky. These five planes broke through enemy interceptors and plunged into targets at Lingayan Gulf. An accompanying observation plane reported that one hit a battleship, another a cruiser, and the other three each struck large transports. All these direct hits were followed by terrific explosions. The scout plane took photographs of these hits, but in the ground fighting that these photographs were lost, leaving us no tangible evidence of what this valiant flight achieved. So ended the work of the Special Attack Corps at Mabalakat, and very shortly from all Philippine airfields, the Corps had been in existence only since the 20th of October. Yet in that time, up until disbanding or withdrawal of the Japanese air forces from the Philippines, a total of 424 planes had sorted from Philippine bases for kamikaze attacks, and according to the best reports obtainable, they had scored the following successes. Type of enemy ship sunk damaged, carriers 13, battleships 13, cruisers 58, destroyers 31, transports 23. The reports on the last kamikazes from Mabalakat did not reach me immediately, for I had been summoned to a headquarters conference at Bamban, just after they had taken off. At Bamban I found that the conference was concerned with two related but independent projects. One was the study of how best to convert units of the 1st Air Fleet into effective land combat troops. The other was the organisation of a farewell party for the 2nd Air Fleet, upon the occasion of its withdrawal to Formosa. As a member of the 1st Air Fleet, I was in attendance with the leader of my group. Since my flight training at Kasumigara Air Station, I had spent 12 years as an aviator. Yet, with the sortie of the five planes led by Lieutenant Nakano that afternoon, my flying career had come to an end, and I was to become an infantryman. The day's discussions, which actually generated more heat than light, centred about problems quite alien to anything for which we naval aviators had either training or experience. Our concern from now on, it appeared, was to be with building defensive positions, finding out where to assign our various units, and learning how to secure weapons, ammunition and food. The only issue of infantry equipment that had been made was a half-dozen carbines allocated for the use of sentries. In addition, a few light machine guns had been dismounted from damaged planes, 
but the 20mm machine guns of the Zeros were too heavy and cumbersome to be carried away for use in our mountain positions. I was apprehensive about fighting on land, and tried hard to recall some of the basic elements we had studied at the Naval Academy 20 years before. When the land warfare meeting ended, I went with my commanding officer to join in discussion of the other subject of the moment. Since its arrival in the Philippines a short two months before, the second air fleet had tasted with us all the bitterness of war. Now we were gathered together in a small shelter cave to bid them farewell. Dishes of dried cuttlefish and cups of sake were arranged on long tables. The festivities got underway when Admiral Fukudome and his second air fleet staff arrived. With the food and drink went the usual exchanges of the commonplace pleasant trip, may you have success, good luck, see you soon, and so on. But in our hearts, we knew that this was a permanent leave-taking. Two bombers were coming from Formosa that evening to pick up the second air fleet staff officers. At the conclusion of the party, there were cars waiting to take them from our mountain position to the waiting planes at Clark Field. Word came, before our farewell party had ended, that a large convoy was west of Iber and moving northward. There was now no doubt that its destination was Lingayan Gulf.